So good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending where in the world you are. I think we're spanning at least two sides of the Atlantic today. Uh, my name is Adam Roberts. I'm the Midwest correspondent of The Economist. I've been at The Economist for 20 plus years and reported from lots of different continents, including South Asia, Africa, and, and Europe, as well as now in the United States. And I'd like to welcome everyone to a panel where we discuss the intersection of climate change and the global food supply. Um, we have a, a very august, excellent panel today. So I'm very briefly going to ask our three panelists to introduce themselves. We have, just to quickly run through uh, the speakers in the order that I have, uh, we have Dr. <coughs> David Nabarro, um, who is the co-director of the Imperial College Institute of Global Health Innovation at Imperial College London. And for those of you who know the World Food Prize, you probably know that David was the, uh, the recipient in 2018 um, together with Laurence Haddad of the, of the World Food Prize. Um, we have the British Ambassador to the United States, Dame Karen Pierce, who's joining us from, from Washington, DC. Uh, she tells us she's not in a very grand house this morning. She's in a much smaller house down the road from the normal <laughs> grand one. And I'm delighted too that we're joined by Barry Parkin from Mars Incorporated. Um, Barry has the main responsibility for overseeing sustainable uh, development goals or sustainable supply chains in the company. So we'll, we'll have perspective from the private sector, from the scientific academic world and from government. So I think we have three excellent perspectives to bring in here. Maybe I could just ask each of you to, in a sort of one minute introduction, beginning with you, David, just to tell us about your work and, and who you are and how, how you fit into this world of climate change together with the food supply. I'm one of these people, Adam, who's hopped from job to job not spending long enough, really, uh, probably uh, caused too much trouble. But the last uh, 15 years uh, was spent mostly in the United Nations, working on food, on climate, and on major disease challenges like Ebola, cholera, and so on. So I'm one of these intersection people, and that's why I'm here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Ambassador Pierce, could you tell us a little bit about your background just so we can have the context for this discussion? Uh, so I'm a career diplomat. Uh, I spent most of my time dealing either in the UN uh, or in conflict situations in Afghanistan uh, or the Balkans. But I first met David uh, when I was at the UN in Geneva uh, and of course had a lot to do with the World Food Programme and David was also instrumental in helping deal with the food security crisis uh, in 2008. Um, so I have a, a long-standing interest in these issues and in terms of climate, uh, Britain and Italy will together host COP26 in November next year. Uh, the other fact I should tell you about David is that he's a mean person on the dance floor. So just to put that out there. <laughs> could, could be crucial for this discussion. <laughs> And, and Barry, could you? Oh, that's that one. Barry, could you just quickly tell us in one or two minutes about your your um, your biography and how you fit into this conversation too? Yeah, sure. And uh, thanks for inviting me. Delighted to be here, Adam. So, um, yeah, I, I'm a career Martian um, and uh, have worked for Mars for uh, 35 years. So um, I uh, I'm fully fully uh, in the private sector. Uh, Mars, I think everybody knows, hopefully you're buying some of our products, um, either in the confectionery space or in the pet care space. Um, I head up procurement and sustainability, so I've got a supply chain uh, background. And um, you might ask why procurement and sustainability? Well, it's, you know, when we look at our footprint, whether greenhouse gas, land, income, all the challenges of sustainable development, then 90% plus of those issues and impacts are upstream in what we buy, embedded in raw materials or packaging. So, you know, if we don't solve what we buy, we don't solve sustainability for our business. And uh, that's why we put procurement and sustainability together and uh, hopefully talk a bit about that uh, during this panel. Um, outside of Mars, I, uh, I've been involved for a number of years with a number of um, sort of cross uh, uh, industry coalitions of action. So I chair the World Cocoa Foundation work, which is trying to drive sustainable development in cocoa. Um, and I co-chair the work of the Consumer Goods Forum on Plastic Waste, which is obviously another major challenge for, for the world. Um, and delighted to be here. 
Great. Well, I'm delighted all, all of the panelists are here. I should just let the audience know that David will have to leave a little earlier than our other panelists. So we may focus somewhat more on David's thoughts in the initial part of this conversation, but I'd like all of our panelists to feel very welcome to, to join in and to respond to each other. We'd like to have this as a free flowing conversation as much as we can. David, in, in your very helpful brief introduction just a moment ago, you talked about the intersection of all these different challenges that the world throws at us, whether it's disease or climate change or food security. Right now, the, the disease that's or the illness that's on everyone's mind is of course COVID-19. That has a profound economic effect. We've seen very, very severe slowdowns in economies all over the place. And at the same time, whether it's the fires in California or the storms and floods that have hit the, the Midwest of America in the last couple of years, we're growing increasingly conscious of how climate change is going to affect our, our lives. How do you, as a, how do I put it nicely, a jack of all trades, try to bring these together and explain uh, how you're managing to think through these different challenges in one go? Adam, thank you. I, in a way, I hope you'll ask these questions also uh, of Karen and Barry, because we've all been struggling with a sort of reality that that is beset us in the world, which is we divide things up into easily manageable pieces, and then we give them to folk who've got a particular discipline in their professional training, or who belong to a particular government department, or who have a particular trade in where they work and we say you're the right to do with this issue go off and deal with it so there's a gang of people who go off and deal with health problems and they tend to be doctors and with training in public health and then there's another group of people who do with environmental problems like nature and the destruction of nature they've been a bit out the way until recently, but suddenly they've come out into the open because we realized that nature is being destroyed at a terrible rate. And then there's another group who deal with climate and they have conferences and language. And over time, these separate groups really have become somewhat introverted. They have their own code for their conversation. They have their own targets. They have their own processes. And over the last 10 years, I think we've all realized that this doesn't really work. And in fact, everything is just remarkably densely connected. And uh, that actually, we have to deal with some of the really big challenges that face the people of our world and the planet itself in a way that's joined up. Now that is hard because I mean the, the predominant intellectual philosophy that many of us have been brought up on is one that says if you've got a problem strip it down simplify it down to the most crucial element find the thing that matters the most and then work out the solution and then scale up that solution and then with any luck, you'll resolve the problem. It's a reductionist. In much of health, if we look over the last few decades, there's been a real emphasis on finding the drug, the vaccine, or the approach that will deal with malaria, or deal with schistosomiasis, or deal with obesity. And then suddenly, uh-uh, don't work doesn't work because everything's interconnected. And so I've seen in the, last, in the last 10 years, a really quite dramatic shift. Not everybody's caught up with it and there are a lot of people in different places and still the political system hasn't quite understood it, but it's learning to deal with complex issues as though they are systems challenges and not as though they are simple linear challenges. So instead of saying there's a problem, there's a solution, let's bring the solution and the problem together and resolve it. Now we're starting to say, ah, oh, there's quite a lot of different factors that come together and are interlinked. 
and we have to deal with them together as a system. Well, actually, world leaders in 2005 got their heads around this and came out with the only plan that we've got for the future of our world called the Sustainable Development Agenda. But it turned out that that 2015 was a bit of an exceptional time. I don't think we could get world leaders to come together and have a transverse solution to our problems right now. It might change, you never know. And so we are, we've gone through a really intriguing phase. In 2015, we had the most incredible agreement on climate. Really, really good agreement. I know about it because of trying to pull it together. We had the most incredible agreement uh, on sustainable development. We had an incredible agreement coming up. It didn't quite work on migration. And um, we did some pretty good stuff on health, but we, we sort of slightly dismantled things. So it's going to be, it's going to not be a straightforward thing, Adam, but the, the, the recognition among the majority, the majority of the world's leaders that things have to be dealt with together is there. But you go to, say, the Prime Minister of Fiji, he's very straight, you know, I, I've yeah. got seven problems in my country. So that's, I think, where we're headed to now is dealing with problems together. And um, the question that, that all of us ask ourselves is, are the political instruments that guide people like me who are working inside the machine room, are they going to give us the space to do this? Or are we going to be feeling a little bit frustrated? I don't know, is the answer. And COVID is a bit of a testing ground, and it's particularly testing right, right now. I want, to, I want to come back to COVID in a moment, and thank you very much for that, for kicking that off. Um, at the risk of being reductionist and, and maybe saying there is sort of one response to <clears throat> many different problems, you, you've hinted at international cooperation being absolutely crucial to this. Yes. Therefore, having political leaders who who want to cooperate and, and see some benefit in, in having allies and having partners working on the same problem. When I look at the geopolitical uh, setup at the moment, there seems less and less prospect for encouraging cooperation in, in some sectors anyway, uh, but perhaps you know, political events will change and, and we'll get to a different, a different era. One thing, Adam, it's only a relatively small number of leaders who are saying, I don't want to play. We look at this thing called COVAX, which is a risk sharing system for countries to be able to access the vaccine against COVID when it becomes available. I think it's 140 plus countries have joined yeah. and it's going up quickly. I, I really do think there's only 15 to 20 countries who've got leaders who are saying we're not playing. Yeah, I think, and that's 193 countries altogether. So there's, I still think that the majority are into collective action. I won't interrupt you again. Well, no, that's, that's very helpful. And well, it leads us naturally into Ambassador Pierce's uh, comment that she made earlier about uh, the COP meeting and the importance of Britain and Italy hosting this. When it comes to international cooperation, what could we expect to see from this, this meeting, Ambassador? In what way are we going to see greater international cooperation harnessed at, at this meeting that uh, you referred to? Uh, well, thank you very much, Adam, and I, I you know, agree with what David said about um, all coming together to get a coherent approach, and nobody knows more about that than, than David does. Um, I think the main thing about COP26, five years from Paris, uh, we need to engineer, bring about, with people's help, a step change uh, in the level of action and the level uh, of ambition. Uh, so we're really looking uh, for the national contributions uh, to make very strong pledges uh, that are right at the top end uh, of ambition, that's one. Uh, Alex Sharma, who is our COP26 coordinator, he's also our business and industry secretary, uh, he has been talking to a number of countries, uh, including at the UN in New York, he visited uh, when I was there. And it's also clear that from the developing country side, uh, they need more help in adaptation and resilience. Uh, and that is one of the themes that we want to push with Italy uh, at Glasgow. And that, that's quite an interesting one because it links immediately uh, into what we were saying uh, about food security and, and biodiversity. 
so we want to be able to help on that side uh, with things like developing new crops uh, and helping developing countries build their own resilience uh, infrastructure. Uh, then we have four other themes around um, low emissions, uh, new energy. Uh, who would have thought uh, even five years ago that the UK would shortly become uh, the biggest producer uh, of offshore wind in the developed world? I mean, it's, it's just was never on any of our radar screens and yet here we are. Uh, and we're just about to get the world's biggest wind farm and GE recyclables will be providing uh, the turbines for that. So we're very much pushing at an open door, I think. And as David was saying, there are very few countries uh, who don't want to be part uh, of this enterprise. Uh, and even where you have a country that perhaps doesn't want to be, you have subnational parts of government uh, here in the States we work with governors and city halls uh, to advance the climate agenda. Uh, so that's two of the themes, adaptation and resilience, um, low emissions, uh, new energy, actually that's, that's three themes, I can't count. Uh, and then there's something very important around nature, uh, which also talks to the food uh, aspect that, that, that um, you, you raised at the beginning, uh, and then something around climate finance. Uh, where we're making very good progress uh, along with the UN uh, and Mark Carney, who's advising uh, the UN on the financial uh, aspects of this. And across all those five areas, uh, we hope that countries and governments and subnational people uh, will come to Glasgow uh, for the COP26 and we will be able to have a very good set of pledges uh, that are then implemented in full. Uh, so that's, that's the outline. Yeah. Uh, as an interim, there will be a conference on the 12th of December uh, that our Prime Minister Boris Johnson will host, uh, and that's all around biodiversity and preparing for COP. Uh, so we really want to use that to turn the dial as we go into 2021. Can I follow up on what David said in, in his opening statement, the importance of thinking holistically, trying to see how all these different crises that the world is facing at one time do interrelate with each other? Ambassador, could you talk us through if you have any thoughts on how the response to the COVID crisis might shed some light on how we could respond to the climate crisis? Are we seeing something, for example, in the way that governments are able to cooperate in scientific research or in, uh, in the way that uh, different agencies, maybe at the subnational level, will get together and, and cooperate that shed some light on what we will do to, to speed up the response to climate change that you just referred to? Maybe there are some positive things that come out of the, the COVID crisis that we can learn from to apply to the to the climate crisis? Uh, I think that's exactly right, Adam. I think the first positive thing is that more and more governments are talking about the need to come out of COVID in a way that reinforces two things. One is open societies, uh, but the second is around sustainable recovery, greener recovery, uh, sustainable economic development. So I think just the idea has got a big boost uh, from COVID and now um, certainly our assistance programmes will reorientate uh, to support those themes. Um, there's a lot more collaboration at the scientific level uh, than before. And in UK, US, uh, we've always collaborated very closely um, scientifically and America has a fantastic uh, record of innovation, uh, particularly in life sciences. Uh, and we think we do pretty well uh, as well. Um, but I think more countries are coming into that scientific uh, collaboration. And one of the thoughts behind this D10 idea, Democracies 10, major uh, democracies in the world, is precisely to get together uh, to deepen and accelerate that scientific uh, cooperation. And yes, uh, it will not just be looking at medicines when it gets going. It, it'll want to take account uh, of, of all these areas. And um, I think in some more uh, tangible ways, um, there's a lot of focus now, even, even among countries that might not be the leading lights of tackling climate change, on the jobs and growth uh, aspects of, of how you do it. Uh, we find there's a lot of interest in some of our uh, energy efficient programs for buildings, uh, a lot of interest in how we've created uh, jobs. 
And I think that uh, will be a very strong area of collaboration. Uh, it's not just about the science, of course, it's fundamentally uh, getting economics ministries together. Yeah. Um, but I think that will be uh, an increasing theme, uh, partly because voters want it. So it's in anybody's interest <laughs> uh, to respond to the electorate, to their citizens' uh, concerns. Uh, but I also think people uh, are starting to see a way through uh, whereby tackling climate change can be used as a spur to the economy. I think one of the really interesting things about G20 uh, and, and G7 this year was that although leaders couldn't meet in person, the fact that you could have virtual meetings actually put more ministers in touch with each other than you would normally have had. So you actually got science ministers in the G20 uh, talking to each other virtually. Uh, so I think you're absolutely right. We can keep this up as we come out of the pandemic, and we can find specific areas uh, to collaborate on that will help us pool the science. So actually, I think that is a good thing to come out of COVID. Okay, good Good that there's something positive to come out of the pandemic. Barry, I want to bring you in in a moment, but I'd just like to give David the chance, if you have a thought on the same question of how you would respond to the idea that there may be some lessons to take from the COVID response that we can apply, for example, to whether it's the specific discussions of the COP26 or more generally to how we respond to climate change. Are there insights that you would take from the public health challenges to apply to the climate challenge? I think you're muted still, David. There we go. Yeah, go. clown when it comes to the muting department. Um, first of all, um, I want to say uh, just a special shout out to Barry who um, I think he and his colleagues in the company are doing some really interesting stuff on sustainability and just wanted just to say that. Uh, what's happening on COVID is absolutely fascinating. You know, there are some who say that, that the countries that are doing best on COVID are countries in Africa, are countries in Asia, and uh, one or two countries also in Latin America and the Caribbean. But they're not rich countries. And you ask yourself, why? Firstly, the way you do have to do with COVID, like any other infectious diseases, you have to deal with it locally, bringing together local actors. You can't do it from hundreds of kilometers away in the capital. If you've got a problem in Manaus, you have to deal with it locally. If you've got a problem in Eastern, town, uh, Eastern Cape, you've got to deal with it in Eastern Cape. You've got a problem in Darabi slum in Bombay, you've got to deal with it there. Can't deal with Darabi from Delhi. Can't deal with Manaus from Brasilia. It's making people realize the importance of local action, integrated local action. Secondly, we look, we see that there's a whole series of food challenges, probably a doubling in the number of people who are poor uh, by the end of this year, possibly a doubling in the number of malnourished. So we've got food systems in real trouble. We've got employment messed up, particularly tourism, but also many other employment areas. And we've got real challenges for children missing a big chunk of education. So this is meaning that you have to approach it in an interdisciplinary way. COVID is the revealer. It reveals problems in so many different areas. So interdisciplinary working, not everywhere, but it's starting. Thirdly, different stakeholders coming together. You know, a lot of my work is with businesses. It's not with governments. I do work with governments, but businesses are really interested in what's food, what's catering, what's air travel, what's tourism, all these sectors, what's going to look like in two or three years time. And we talk about it and they really have to make some really tricky decisions about staffing, about investment and about opening new lines of business. So there's a lot of multi-stakeholder working, but not just with businesses, with community-based organizations, rights-based organizations. It's a completely different energy. And then fourthly, last point, participation that uh, you can't do any of these 
difficult disease issues without the people being alongside. And in fact, like we learned on Ebola in West Africa in 2014, with um, particularly in Liberia, the people did it. It wasn't actually done by people in white vehicles walking around with funny uniforms on saying I'm from the UN or I'm from Medicine Sans Frontier. It was done by local community organizations. I think we're learning the same on this. And the, so I'm saying this because I think it's more about how we organize ourselves to deal with really complex challenges than about the way in which our different processes work. I think if we can get local, multi-stakeholder, interdisciplinary and participative ways of working more recognized and appreciated, then our, our national and global apparatus, whether it's things like the COP and, and the British COP, this COP26 is going to be brilliant because of the way in which I see people coming together on it. But I think we can possibly look to these big processes shifting a bit. So they're more people-centered, more interdisciplinary, more multi-stakeholder, bringing together business, civil society, science, and all the different groups, more participatory, and that'll be for good. So an example, UK in a climate summit last year, really championed resilience on the, on the 23rd of September. And that was as a result of a really strong line taken by the government. But it was super important because by bringing resilience and adaptation into the center of the climate discussion, it suddenly becomes more people-centered. You're not all the time talking about, is it two degrees or 1.5 degrees? You're talking about how people can protect themselves against storm surges or droughts or salination. And, and it gets interesting, especially because of my interest in food. And that's where we find the link between food and climate is so strong. So to finish, I actually think that some of the new ways of working that have become so important on COVID, that have had, have, they've been a bit hard for the rich countries to learn. I mean, you, you, I don't want to talk about specific countries too much, uh, certainly not the, the ones in which we're all sitting at the moment. But I do want to talk about the new ways of thought and action that I see coming up, and they're coming up really fast, and they're pushed a lot by younger people, people under 25. They're saying, stop your nonsense, you lot. Just focus on what really matters. And, it, and it is, it's requiring all of us to say, well, why have we created these sort of crazy silos and processes? Can't we just adapt to what's going on? And I know what's happening. It's happening in the UN. The UN knows that it has to change. It's happening in the relationships between business and government. Go to Mars and you talk to the chief senior executives of Mars. They're actually asking the question, what's our company going to be like in 100 years' time? And they're having to rethink. They can't just go on making bars of sugar. I mean, they're going to have to change. Well, that's the perfect segue for then me to bring in our uh, representative from the private sector, Barry. Could you talk us through how you at Mars are looking at this intersection of sustainability and climate and what you as a company are doing to respond to that and pick up off a couple of points that David made there, which I think were sort of focused at the role that both local actors but also private actors can play in, in tackling these challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe just to build on David's comment in terms of, um, you know, what have we learned from COVID? I think, you know, we've learned that humankind is brilliant in a crisis. You know, and all actors, uh, you know, mobilise, and it's amazing what uh, what has been achieved in the last six months or so. And I think the problem we've got with climate fundamentally is that most people don't yet feel it, see it, feel it as a crisis, and, and none of us have cracked that yet. And I don't, I don't have an answer here today, but um, we're not acting collectively as if it's a crisis yet. Um, that said, I think there are some uh, examples of progress, and you know, I thought I think you know this intersection of uh, food security and climate action is uh, you know is it a tension or is it an opportunity? I want to give you an example about one of the, one of the areas we've wrestled with over the over the years, and uh, we'll talk about palm oil. Um, it's a perfect example of this. Uh, and so, just sort of three context points: the palm oil, it's in half of the products in a supermarket. 
it's in food, it's in snacks, it's in personal care, it's in cleaning products. Half of the products you find in the supermarket contain palm oil, and it's growing. Um, second fact, it's driving massive deforestation in Southeast Asia in particular, in Indonesia and Malaysia. And, and the third fact, it's the most effect, efficient vegetable oil. So it uses less land than anything else. So what do we do? You know, it's driving climate change, but it's also supporting food security because it's using less land. How, how, do, you, how do you wrestle with that? And I think we, like every other company, has been around the circle of, do you get out of palm or do you stay and try and fix palm? And um, our conclusion is stay and try and fix it and, uh, and make it truly sustainable. And we've, we've done that by uh, redesigning, reimagining the supply chain. And we used to buy this as a commodity where we bought it from you know, a load of different actors and we really didn't know where it came from. What we've done is, it, is massively simplified our supply chain. Um, we've gone from you know 1500 palm mills that we bought from to less than 100 and probably onto a pathway to perhaps less than 10. And only when we do that can we really put in place the due diligence necessary to demonstrate there's no deforestation and there are no human rights issues. So we've re radically changed the, the supply chain over the last three years to get to a point where we now believe that um, it is deforestation free. Um, we've mapped it. We've, we've got management practice in place and we're monitoring it. And it's truly deforestation free. So palm can be done well. And that then is good for the planet. It's good for the farmers. It's good for consumers. Um, but on top of that, back to the systems point, we've got to be part of changing the system. It's not good enough for us just to sort out our own supply chain. We've got to be part of changing the system. And in our case, the, the, the lever that we can pull is the, to demand that our suppliers, the people on the ground, not only deliver to me, Mars, clean palm oil, but deliver to all their customers. Uh, or otherwise they don't do business with us. So we have to use our economic strength to drive change more broadly across the supply chain. And that starts to build some scale. And if the other actors follow us in that path, then we start to drive change in the industry. So we're always looking for how do we solve the problem in our supply chain, but how do we also drive system change? And this is a great example, I think, of where if we do this right, we, we solve climate change, but also we remove the pressure uh, on, uh, on, on food crops and, and find that win-win. <clears throat> We've had a question which I love because it goes against everything the three of you have been saying so far. So I, I want to put it in there just to stir up some debate. Stephen Long has, has submitted a, a point to say, it's all very well talking about this holistic response and systemic challenges, but in the context of the World Food Prize, keep in mind that a single innovation can have a major effect for example, on sustainable food supply. And he points out that Norman Bolog's genetic improvement of harvest index, which he says required a single gene and his parallel work in rice dramatically reduced the incidence of famines while increasing sustainability for the next few decades. So essentially his question is, is trying to consider all aspects then gonna inhibit uh, efforts to, to focus on innovations such as Norman Bolog? So maybe David, while we still have you, you might want to respond to that challenge from the audience. Oh, do both. I'm just going to say do both. Gosh, I'm desperate for effective treatments and vaccines against this horrid virus. And so, yeah, I want it. I want the, the magic instrument. Uh, I'm trying not to use mil military metaphors these days. Mm -hmm. I want the magic solution. But at the same time, you know, we don't have these single remarkable technological things at all times. And of course, I totally agree uh, that what uh, Dr. Borlaug did, which was a result of his own systems thinking, he knew, according to my understanding, that this was an area where technology could make a difference to a whole series of systems. And he, I, I, I talked to with the World Food Prize people yesterday, they're also saying that they've got plenty of evidence that also, he understood that you, you do have to consider other variables. So I'm going to say, yes, we have to keep going for the breakthrough technologies, the innovations. But at the same time, we must recognize the interdependence of processes and the need to be people-centered, local in our way of working and systems. And we need to be clever enough 
and I, I, I think that all of us are thinking a lot about what capacities there are in not so much our rather older brains, but in the younger brains. We've got to be clever enough to be able to do both. Very, very focused, tech-driven innovation, whether it's the Pan Mall story or something like that. And then at the same time, the interconnected thinking that really you need, and you absolutely needed to deal with COVID right now. You can't deal with COVID now without having a multivariate solution that has to plug into a lot of different aspects of life and society. And that's one of the reasons why some governments are finding it super hard to do. So I'm, a, I'm, go, I'm not going to be helpful to you, Adam, because I'm saying, got to go both ways. Can't do it just down one path. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not scared of that. I'm not okay. impressed about it either. Great. It doesn't have to be either or. Ambassador Pierce, would you agree with that? I mean, do you think that, for example, we, we've had another question just asking, how do you operationalize? or how do you operationalize? How do you actually do these things? How do you bring it down to the grounds? It's all very well talking about the holistic goals, whether it's the climate change goals or food security, but how do you make it concrete? Would you see concrete action points coming out of the COP26 meeting? Would you look for very specific hard nuggets of things that we can look at after that meeting? Um, yes, definitely on, on COP26. And I, I completely agree with David, you do both. Uh, and you can do, you can do both because you've got these wonderful scientists who are not sitting around um, debating, but actually getting on and doing. There is a bureaucratic risk, so for people like me, um, in trying to do too much all at once, that you never actually uh, get to the first step and hence the second. Uh, and that's something um, government administrators, ministers, officials need to guard against. Uh, but done well, it can be liberating. And I know David wanted to avoid uh, military metaphors, but there are some very interesting descriptions of how um, Churchill worked uh, during the Second World War, where you had different people in the room that then led to collaborations and, and good things coming out of that. So it can be done, but it's actually quite hard to do it uh, in stable conditions, because uh, there is a, a risk of going round in circles, to be absolutely frank. But that's only on the, the bureaucratic side, my side, as, as it were. For us, I think part of doing any good policy or creating any framework wherein David and the scientists can do their work is to make yourself conscious that you need to find those first steps. Uh, so I think in that sense, it can be done. And in terms of COP26, I think it's very similar to the um, Millennium Development Goals Summit uh, we had in 2008 in the UN, where the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown uh, was instrumental, not just in getting the pledges, uh, but in how people were actually going to use them. Uh, so absolutely, it can be done. No. Barry, thank you for, for making it so concrete in your previous response where you talked about palm oil. We, we've had another question uh, where there's a request to, to talk about diet and how people's diet is changing and how that has fundamental challenges for the food supply chain around the world. And I think you, you, you referred to this where you talked about the deforestation in, in Southeast Asia. But I know from being a correspondent in India for five years and seeing the rise of protein in people's diets, the, the shift to eating meat rather than vegetables, there's a profound impact on the environment and on people's health when they change their diet. Sometimes the change to health is actually very positive. But how do you see that affecting what you do as a company, for example? You, you've given us a great example with palm oil, but I wonder if you can think through any more about how that's affecting what you do. Yeah, no, I think um, you know sustainable consumption is clearly Part of this equation and um, you know to, to make it uh, you know very concrete it, you know what we know is that animal protein is one of the biggest drivers of greenhouse gas emissions deforestation in the Amazon and other places around the world and both directly and indirectly and it's you know also the grains that are fed to uh, animals uh, soy in particular is driving deforestation so the growth so as, as the world shifts to more animal proteins, we are struggling with uh, land use and deforestation and climate change. So how do you break that tension? Um, you know, I think 
the, the problem we've got at the moment is that more people are shifting to animal protein than they're shifting out of animal protein. That's, that's the reality. There's some fantastic innovation in uh, alternative meats uh, that are, you know, you can go to Burger King and get your, uh, uh, you know, your meat-free uh, burger that looks and tastes like a, uh, a burger, but, but it's still the minority. So we have to increase that shift. Um, so the net shift to uh, animal proteins is reduced, uh, frankly. Now, in our own business, um, we're a pet food business. We, uh, we use uh, a lot of animal proteins, and, and we have shifted away from beef to other proteins, some animals, some vegetable proteins, but beef is the worst by far. And uh, by shifting away, we're reducing our carbon footprint um, of our uh, pet food business. So, yeah, I think it, 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 we can all play a role. Any manufacturer that's in the protein space can, can play a role in uh, putting products in front of consumers that are great tasting, uh, but use, uh, have a lower carbon footprint. Barry, I'd love to know where the motivation comes for a company like Mars to do that. Is, are you driven to do that because consumers are telling you that it's very important to them? Are you doing it because it makes sense for the bottom line? Where does the company get the strongest motivation to act in this way? The lesson from that might be relevant to a whole lot of other companies and a lot of other actors. It's, it's a great question. And, and you know, it, it ends up being uh, a combination of things. I think it, it starts with it's the right thing to do. You know, we, we have a strong belief that uh, uh, as, as a big corporate um, and with a big carbon footprint, we need to think and act just as a country would. We need to set science-based targets and, and hit them. So, you know, we did that, started doing that 10 years ago. So, you know, we have committed to reduce our, our carbon footprint. How do you do that? You do a whole bunch of things, renewable energy, shifting ingredients, stopping deforestation. So it starts with the right thing to do. We also think there will be an economic um, uh, return on this. Uh, we believe strongly that it needs to be a price on carbon um, universally. And if we've got a lower carbon footprint, we'll have a lower cost base. So we think there's an economic rationale. Um, and, and then, of course, we're hearing it from consumers. And the trick and the hard part, frankly, is how do you... Um, how do you engage consumers in the product um, when you're doing less bad? Um, uh, it's all very well giving them a, a, something that they feel good about, but, um, and, and, and all companies are struggling to market uh, environmental benefits in particular to, to consumers, but we continue to try to do that. And more and more consumers are, are telling us that they will uh, select environmentally um, friendly products. Yeah, well, that sounds right. And, and at the risk of being reductionist, but David has sadly left the conversation, but it allows me to be a bit reductionist. The Economist has long campaigned for a, a carbon tax as a sort of a, a policy response that has a sort of widespread impact across many different uh, sectors. So it may be something that a future president in the United States, for example, might be more willing to consider than, than the current one. Uh, Nicola Dyer has, has submitted a question, which might be far too specific for any of us on the panel to answer, but I think it's a, an intriguing one especially for British people who come from an island nation, it's asking whether we'll use more resources from the sea, seaweed, sea greens, sea vegetables. Are there resources that aren't fully tapped, uh, for example, from the sea that we'll be able to, to, to make more of in the future? Uh, is there potential there uh, for changing the way we consume our food? I don't know if either of you have strong <laughs> views about the sea uh, or whether COP26 will have any element in it, Ambassador, where there's a reference to sea seagoing uh, peoples or nations such as such as Britain. I'm happy to have a quick go at that. Um, right. Yes, absolutely. And I think there's lots of protein in the ocean that, you know, not just fish and so vegetable protein. Um, and, you know, we've we have spent uh, years looking and testing and trialing different proteins because um, for our pet food business and uh, there are some there's some very promising uh, vegetable proteins. Uh, there's also some fantastic uh, nutrients uh, in the sea. Algae is a phenomenal material and we've been running a series of experiments that show that that can transform uh, the quality of soil um, and uh, not only retain more water uh, but, but sequester more carbon. So there's some really cool technologies that are still being really understood which, uh, you know, when materials from the sea can also help on ground. So uh, I think it has huge potential. Yeah. 
we at The Economist have also been celebrating the potential from insects and how if we would only switch to eating a few more locusts and uh, also in the pet food industry, I know that insects are being investigated for uh, creating pet food as well. There may be potential there from mealyworms and, and others. Yeah. Um, Ambassador, while we have two or three minutes left, I'd like to turn the conversation towards the end to developing countries. because I know that Britain as, a, as an AIDS donor has, has immense impact around the world. I'm wondering how much in your work you've looked at the, the food sector as an important part for, for Britain to focus on in helping developing countries, obviously in, in food supply, but also just more generally in, in economic development. Is that, is that a focus of COP26? Is that still a focus for the, for the British government to look at in, in development aid? Um, I think that's, that is right. Under the nature strand uh, of, of COP26, this will look at um, some of those things we've been talking about. Um, and you mentioned um, ocean going uh, communities and, and countries. Uh, there are, that's obviously a group of countries. I think it's something like 53 at the UN, small uh, island developing states with these enormous uh, oceanic spaces. Uh, they obviously need a lot of help on the finance side because uh, they need to access instruments in a way that's directly relevant to them, whereas most of the financial instruments are, are relevant to, to countries with very different circumstances. Uh, and then, as David was saying, there's a very important part of the adaptation uh, and resilience piece. Um, so I think on the water side, uh, particularly, you've got the Clean Water uh, Initiative. Um, on the uh, development assistance side that we give, we put a lot of effort uh, into uh, new crop varieties, uh, helping communities with more efficient farming systems, uh, the sort of thing uh, Barry was mentioning, and also helping more productive markets and value chains so that the benefits get uh, closer and closer uh, to the communities. Uh, now, we give something like um, $600 million a year uh, to the World Food Programme for that. Um, I think we're the third largest donor, and we have a number of other schemes uh, that are dedicated to things like seed funding, uh, so that we can help communities develop uh, good practices. Uh, we put a lot into um, developing the crops, as I say, and um, helping the science there. Uh, but I think when we get to um, COP26, uh, we'll be taking forward in 2021 exactly how best to exploit the nature theme. So I can't give you too many details at the moment because we're still getting to grips with that. Um, but if any of your listeners, or, or indeed David or Barry, uh, have, have good ideas, then we're very happy uh, to hear those. And we will use the 12th of December event to start that process. Well, I hope at the very least you'll be handing out insect burgers and locust snacks for people to, to be enjoying at the, uh, at the event. I have eaten locusts, uh, but I had to cover them in toffee, I have to admit. <laughs> Almost anything is edible when it's covered in chocolate. Indeed, and indeed. Barry, we're coming to the last couple of minutes of, of this session. There is one last question, which I think is, is a great one when it comes to all of these themes, whether it's climate or food supply. It's the question of what do you sacrifice in order to achieve these things? For example, the easy answer might be you know, to find ways not to sacrifice, that you can still have food that is tasty or you can still have food that's nutritious, even if it's less damaging to the environment. But do you think we need to talk about these things in terms of making sacrifices? Or do we talk about it in, the, in terms of saying, well, actually, we can both be better in, in our impact and better in, in how things taste? Is it, is it a debate about sacrifice? Or is it a debate about having win-win outcomes? Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's both. Um, I think, you know, the easiest path is to find the win-win. And then uh, you know, everybody gets on board quickly. Um, but they're hard to find. I think there are certainly in, in the short term trade-offs. So, uh, you know, corporates need to make trade-offs in the short term. We need to invest in becoming a sustainable business and that will reduce our earnings in the short term. That is a tough choice that business needs to make. Uh, governments have to make tough choices about um, putting in place unpopular policies um, because they're the right thing to do. So I think all actors have to make tough choices uh, in order 
to drive change. Consumers have to make some tough choices and you know, maybe sacrifice uh, um, consuming, eating the things they, they really enjoy or reducing them in order to uh, do their part. So I, I don't think we can should kid ourselves that there aren't tough choices to be made for everybody. And the sooner we lean into those, the better, I think. Yeah, well, I guess a lot of people have been confronting the need to make sacrifices in, in the face of COVID. And, and so maybe there's uh, an inevitability about that, that we'll have to think about the consequences of these things. Ambassador, I, I think we're just about out of time, but I don't know if you have a, a closing thought you'd, you'd like to, to finish on or otherwise we'll, we'll wrap up there. Uh, I think simply to say that uh, as someone who spent most of their life doing conflict diplomacy, uh, I actually find this sort of thing one of the most rewarding things uh, that diplomacy can, can enable. Uh, so more power uh, to your elbow, more power to David and, and Barry's elbows in what they're doing. And to the World Food Prize itself, of course. Wonderful. Well, it's um, a Chicago time. It's 11.57. I think we're, we need to wrap up now. But thank you to all our panellists, including David, who had to leave to, to do another event, but to Barry Park and Ambassador Karen Pierce, and to all of those who've tuned in and sent questions. Thanks so much for being part of this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. Adam. Thank you.